Hello and welcome. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. We are continuing our conversation about uh, the, uh, the, the potential move to adjust the existing weighting factors. And with us today is T Professor, excuse me, Professor Tammy Colby, who wrote a report uh, to the legislature that was introduced um, to us last year. So welcome, Professor Colby, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the invitation, Representative Webb. Um, just for the record, I'm Tammy Colby. I'm an Associate Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of Vermont. Um, I was one of the uh, people who prepared what is also known as the waiting study. Um, that study was commissioned by the legislature as part of Act 173. So in speaking today, I am representing a group of individuals who worked on this work um, that include uh, Dr. Bruce Baker at Rutgers University, who is a national expert in education finance, and Jesse Levin and Drew Atchison, who are also school finance experts at the American Institutes for Research. Was there a question? Yeah, no, go ahead. Okay, all right. Um, so today what I thought, um, so based on my conversations in advance with Representative Webb, was to sort of go back to the beginning and talk a little bit about what the waiting, what the purpose of the waiting study was, what the charge was, um, what, our, what our methods were, what the findings were, and what the conclusions are. And then that, I think they'll take about 15, 20 minutes. And then to open it up for discussion and questions that uh, you may have for me about the waiting study, I am not prepared to provide specific recommendations or commentary on any one bill. Um, you know, in our role as the contractor and also as sort of independent objective outsiders on the process, you know, we're, we certainly can provide policy analysis on the bills at one at some point if that's if that's requested. But at this point, I think I, we are most useful to you at this point to talk more generally about what the study's findings were and help you to put some of the legislation that's crossing your desk in context of that study. Um, so that's how I see my purpose here today. So mm -hmm. I think Jesse, did you did you give me authority to share screen and all of that? Yes, I did, Tammy. Okay, thanks. Let me. I believe that everyone should have this is a PDF, correct? We all have, we all do have it. So okay, great. Let me just play from the start. Um, there we go. Great. So as I said, the the waiting study um, responds to a specific legislative request that was actually part of Act 173, which I know you've also taken testimony on today and other days, um, and. That's just to be clear that that the legislative request drew a box around what it is that we were supposed to do and really three things. One, um, we were to undertake a study that examines and evaluates the current weights um, that are in our equalized pupil calculation for economically disadvantaged students, English language learners, and secondary level students, and to make recommendations regarding whether or not those weights, the values of those weights should be modified. Two, to consider whether new cost factors and weights should be incorporated into the equalized pupil calculation. And three, to consider whether and to what extent the special education census block grant, oh, that's interesting, should be adjusted for differences in the incidence of and costs of students with disabilities across school districts. So we had three purposes. Look at the existing weights, consider whether or not there should be new weights, and, taught and evaluate and consider whether or not there should be adjustments made to the special education block grant for differences in incidents. But before I go into sort of what we did, I think it's important to step back and, and, ask, and ask the question, why would we even ask these questions in the first place? And I think talking about that for a minute is particularly relevant as you evaluate these different bills that are crossing your desk. So the first big thing to keep in mind is that states are states, including Vermont, are responsible for ensuring equal educational opportunities for all students. That's a constitutional responsibility. However, equal opportunity doesn't necessarily translate to equal educational resources. So students may come to school with different learning needs, socioeconomic backgrounds may require different types and levels of educational supports for students to achieve common outcomes. And you're gonna hear me talk about common outcomes a number of times today. 
And we also recognize that schools in different contexts may also require different levels of resources to provide equal educational opportunities. For example, differences in scale or the prices they must pay for key resources. So right at the outset, we can recognize that schools by virtue of differences in their student population and their context may need to spend different amounts of money in order to bring students to a common level of outcome. Right? All state education funding formula include adjustments for these differences in educational costs across districts, right? And so we call these things cost factors and cost differentials. In Vermont's school funding policy, right, the state largely relies on localities to make appropriate adjustments to their annual budgets for cost factors and then it subsequently adjusts for differences in costs in its funding policy through categorical grants and weighting. So there are two really important points to take away here. First, in Vermont, the way our formula works is that obviously school districts develop, pass, and, and implement their own budgets. The assumption in that model is that school districts are spending the appropriate amount of dollars for students to achieve to, see, to achieve at certain levels stipulated by the state, right? We delegate that responsibility to, to, to local school districts. The second thing is, is that we also recognize that in passing those budgets with the assumption that they're spending what they should, that certain school districts are gonna again have differences in costs and that the, for a fair funding formula to operate, then it's the state's responsibility to equalize those costs particularly cost to taxpayers. There are lots of different ways that states can do that. In Vermont, we use two primary approaches, categorical grants that provide supplemental funding for specific programs and services and weighting. And in Vermont, weighting is for a district's average daily membership for certain cost factors. And then we use this weighted membership to equalize local per pupil spending for the purposes of calculating local tax rates. So that means that our weights operate differently than many other states, right? Our state in Vermont, the weights implicitly adjust for spending differences by equalizing per people spending across districts according to differences in educational costs. And this then impacts local tax burden or the ability to pay for these additional costs of ensuring that all students achieve common educational outcomes. In Vermont, weights do not generate additional state revenue for local school districts. Rather, they're just impacting the price that local, school, that local taxpayers pay for spending. So in a hypothetical example, you can think about it this way. If a budget was unchanged year to year, which that never happens, but let's just pretend that happens for a moment, right? And the number of equalized pupils goes up in that district, then the homestead tax rate would come down. The price that they would pay for those dollars goes down. If you had the same amount of spending, right? And the equalized people calculation goes down. And again, the equalized people calculation is generated with the weights, then you would have a higher homestead tax rate. Notice in all of this, all we're doing is we're talking about how the equalized people calculation, the weights are used to equalize costs or spending across districts for the purposes of calculating tax rates. This was the tax equity mechanism in the school funding formula, which was a requirement under Brigham. So we have four existing weights, three of which were the focus of our study. Economically disadvantaged students, which are weighted 1.25, English language learners, which are 1.20, secondary students, uh, which is defined very broadly as grades seven through 12 as 1.13. Our formula also includes a deflator for pre-kindergarten students at 0.46. We were in our, in our scope of work, we did not consider the pre-K weight. It was, not, it, was not, it was not something that was asked of us. So it's not part of this study. So when we set out to answer those big questions that the legislature posed, we recognized that we needed to use multiple methods to do this. So we did two things. 
One, we spent a lot of time talking to people around the state about the school funding formula, cost differences, the impact that the weights have on spending decisions. We talked to stakeholders from organizations. We talked to districts. We talked to some members of this committee, right? We talked very broadly. And in the report itself, there's an extensive chapter that talks about all the things we learned. We learned some things that I think are useful to this committee that have nothing to do with the weights. So I would also encourage you to read that because there are other things in there that I think are useful to provide context about what's going on in the field. We also then undertook quantitative analysis where we use statistical modeling, which is in our modeling techniques, our state of the field in um, school finance nationally. And to identify the factors that account for differences in educational costs across districts. So what are these things that we should be accounting for? Estimate the cost differential for those things and then translate those cost differentials into weights. And this is important, appropriate to be used in Vermont's existing school funding formula. If you open up statute, there is a very prescribed, there's a prescriptive way that weights are used in the calculation. Our job was not to rethink how the weights were used in the calculation. Our job was to estimate cost differentials and translate those into weights that fit into that existing calculation. And that's gonna come up again in a minute. So I wanna talk about um, two, these two sets of findings quickly, and then we can open it up for discussion. Um, I wanna talk about the stakeholder findings that, that's, that directly uh, sort of speak to this conversation around weights. And the first set of findings is these stakeholder perspectives on cost factors and weights in the formula. And what we found was broad agreement in the field. I mean, remarkably consistent agreement in the field, which was the cost factors incorporated in the calculation do not reflect current educational circumstances. That we are, that the formula is not accounting for all of the things that account for the differences in costs across districts that are outside their control. Two, that the values of the existing weights used in calculating the district's equalized pupil counts have weak ties with the actual differences in the cost of education students with disparate needs or operating schools in different contexts. What does that mean? It means that the weights aren't correctly are miscalibrated with respect to adjusting for the actual differences in costs across districts for things, again, outside their control. Three, the state's small school grant program is problematic in its current design and operation. And four, that there's a need for a specific and targeted grant aid program to support schools struggling to meet different and increasing levels of need due to childhood trauma and mental health concerns. We also talked to stakeholders about their perspectives on the census block grant calculation. Remember that was the third piece of the work we were doing. And frankly, stakeholders were pretty mixed in their perspective on the need for potential adjustments to the grant at this time. And I'm gonna stress that at this time. In this words, at one end of the continuum, and these are direct quotes, you know, we heard the sky's not gonna fall when you, when you implement this. At the other end of the continuum, we heard the correlation between poverty and disability is strong. And somewhere in the middle, and frankly, a lot of the conversation was in the middle, which was, it's just too soon to tell whether the grant's gonna be problematic because it hasn't been implemented. Stakeholders who are concerned about the, how the census grant will be calculated also, however, recognized that in part their apprehension was tied to concerns about the challenges with the existing system for pupil weights. These two funding formula work together, right? We can't think of these things as distinct. And what one example is, is that um, a stakeholder shared with us is that, you know, if the weight for poverty was adjusted to reflect what they thought was actually the true differences in costs for adjusting economically, educating economically disadvantaged students and students with complex socio-emotional needs, then the stakeholders were a lot more comfortable with the census block grant. And if you go back to the, the study that we did on special education that predated this one, one of the key findings in that study was school districts may be, uh, referring students to special education at higher rates because we have a reimbursement system. And that really has been an escape valve for them on the budget side. 
Stakeholder perspectives on the small school grant were pretty consistent. Stakeholders were uniformly opposed to continuing the small school grant program the way it is. In the words of one stakeholder, everyone is looking for a better way forward. Nearly all interview participants viewed the small schools grant program as fundamentally at odds with the policy goals of Act 46. And that's, it for, that's the school consolidation legislation. And there was general agreement though that the state needs to support geographically necessary small schools. So the issue wasn't that the state shouldn't be providing additional dollars to support, again, geographically necessary small schools. It's that the way the small school grant is working is ineffective and problematic. So in the words of one stakeholder, we don't wanna create disincentives with respect to Act 46, but we want to address factors that stress schools and pass risk to opportunity. In general, stakeholders felt that incorporating weights for school size and rurality, which is essentially population density, and the equalized pupil cal calculation would alleviate some of these concerns because that would be systematic, it'd be transparent, and it would adjust in a fair way differences that school districts, differences in costs encountered by school districts operating in rural contexts. There were a couple other considerations identified. Um, there were concerns about the impact of Vermont's early college program on districts long-term weighted membership, which is part of the equalized pupil calculation. There was a general consensus that ECP stu students should still be counted somehow in districts weighted long-term membership as a fraction of a full-time student. It's not that these students just go away, right? They're still receiving counseling services, participating in athletics, but when they go to early college, they come out of the count entirely. And there were underlying concerns that efforts to update the equalized people calculation to better reflect cost differences, right? Which is what the equalized, that's all the equalized per calculation does cost differences, right? And introduce more equity in the system may not translate into increased levels of spending in districts with higher need. For example, in some low spending districts, the additional tax capacity generated through a higher equalized pupil count could be seen as an opportunity to reduce taxes rather than increase spending, right? There is no backstop or sort of floor in the existing legislation, in existing statute that would prevent a district from using an increase, the tax capacity generated by potentially an increased number of equalized people as a tax cut and still spend at below optimal levels. And that goes back to the local decision making authority around how much is spent on a per pupil basis in a, in a school district. In our quantitative analysis, right, we used we, we, we ran our models for the quantitative analysis using three separate data sets in order to triangulate findings across these things. And the reason we did that is, is we were concerned about you know, the Vermont effect, right? Like it would end up that, that because we're using Vermont specific data that we might be picking up Vermont specific artifacts of spending patterns. And so we ran our models and did our analysis using Vermont data, regional data, which of course is the Northeast region with the exception of the Boston metropolitan area because that's not very comparable and, and the cost differences are different there. And then we re-ran them using a national panel of data. So three panels of data in order to check this all out. And what we found was is that there were five cost factors that we identified that are related to differences in educational costs across Vermont schools that are outside their control economic percentage of students who are economically disadvantaged, percentage of students who are English language learners, the percentage of students who are enrolled in the middle grades and the secondary grades, rather than that seven to 12, splitting that up into six to eight and nine through 12. Indicators for geographically necessary small schools, that's, those are small school, those are schools that enroll below a certain threshold that are also located in population sparse areas and independently from that population density of the community in which a district is located. Based on those five things, we then used spending data, again, from these three sources, we modeled out what those cost differentials are. Like for example, how much more does it actually cost for a school to ensure that an economically disadvantaged student 
achieves common outcomes with a non-economically disadvantaged student. And in the appendix of the report, you can actually see the dollar values for what those are. So for example, the, the difference for, I believe, for um, economic disadvantaged students is like $3,500. So we calculated those out, but remember then we had to take that additional step of then figuring out what those cost differentials translated into with respect to a weight that work that is consistent with the existing approach and statute for applying weights for equalized people to calculate equalized people calculation. So what you see here in this slide is the recommended weights for the equalized people calculation. These are the adjusted, these are the, these are the weights that we calculated. These weights are based on, Vermont. remember I said we did Vermont regional and national data? These are actually based on the Vermont data. And we're confident of that because when we did the regional models and the national models, there was remarkable consistency with Vermont, with the exception of English language learner students, which I'll talk about for in a moment. So what you see here are, are weights, right? In this far, on my screen, far right-hand column, right? Weights recommended by the cost function models would be 2.97 for based for, po applied to the poverty rate, which is the indicator in the formula, current formula for economically disadvantaged students, 1.58 for percentage of ELLs, two separate weights, um, for enrollment and why would we have two separate weights? We'd have two separate rates because we could model this and see, first of all, at what point did size no longer matter? And what we found then is within that, that there's an inflection point where there really is a different, first of all, after 250 students, size doesn't really matter for cost differences, but below 250 from 101 to 250, the cost differential is very different than a micro school, less than 100 students, which makes sense, right? Like you would expect economies of scale to perhaps be different. We found the same thing for population density. You'll see that there are these different weights for different densities. And again, that makes sense too. Um, and the weights are 0 0.23, 0 0.17, 0 0.11, depending on the number of persons per square mile in a district. We have a separate weight for middle grades enrollment and secondary grades enrollment. So what we found, contrary to the existing weight, where we say sort of seven to 12 is all one, we actually found that there is a slight difference in costs for middle grades versus high school, 1.23 versus 1.20. Um, so- I'm gonna so stop you for just, just a quick yep. moment. Sorry, I remember- Great, I can get a drink. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> I just noticed that you had a question there. Thanks. Uh, this is a very basic question, but yeah. when I look at this chart, what is confusing to me is that when I see 0 0.25 and 0 0.20, to me that says that those students cost less than that right. they're a fraction of. So I don't right. understand the zero points. Yeah. So another way to think about this is that it would be to make this equivalent to how it operates in the formula, which is really 1.25. It's a multiplier. You, then, then the corresponding weight in the following column would be three point nine seven. So, you need to add one. You need to add one. And, and, and the reason the reason it looks this way is because because in the formula itself, whether or not the uh, weight is an additive weight or a multiplicative weight matters. And so, whether or not you you multiply by one point two five or two point two five is driven by the formula, but it is not a fraction. It is okay. not a fraction of a student. It's tw it's 0.25 more. Chloe well, we went through that, how we get to the weights on, uh, I think it must have been on Friday mm -hmm. uh, that, oh, that showed that. how that works. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Representative Thanks. James, does that answer your question though? Yeah, add one. Yeah, add one. Add one. Add one. Um, but, it, but the reason, that, but there's a second piece to the add one, and I, I want to make this real clear. That's because some of the weights in how the existing statute calculates the equalized people calculation are centered on one and some are not. So that's why this gets a little tricky, um, because some of our weights are additive and some of them are multiplicative. And so when I remember how I talked about we calculated the dollars and you got to sort of backtrack into what that, how those dollars work in a formula. That's, that's, why that, that's why we have to do these kinds of things, okay? And it wasn't, isn't something we came up with. 
It's just, this is how the existing statute does the calculation. And if you, we have to think about if we're taking dollars and, and making, making them into weights that work within the formula, we have to take into account the structure of the existing formula. Okay. Which can make your head spin. It's I'm okay, sorry. it makes my head spin all the time. <laughs> I'm sorry, Representative. That was when you were up in appropriations that Chloe went through all this. So that, that's why you missed, missed this, I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. So it's basically three times in a sense, it's three times. Yep. Yeah. Representative Beck. Hey, Professor Colby, good to see you. It's good to see you. you got a I, good question for me? I don't know. <laughs> um, I have a question though. Okay. <laughs> Regarding population density. Yeah. I understand um, your measures and your weights, but let me just throw an example at you and you tell me how this would apply in this real world example. Okay. I'll use a district that's next next to me. Um, it includes Lindenville and several very small towns that surround Lindenville. And they make up one district now. I'm certain that Lindenville would not fall within any of those population density measurements. They're they're much bigger. Mm -hmm. You know, they're St. Johnsbury like it's an actual town. But I'm sure that every one of the towns that surrounds Lindenville meets one of those criteria. Mm -hmm. So in that situation, let's say that um, when you meld that all together, that the population density of the whole district was, if it, it, didn't, it didn't trip any of those different measurement mm -hmm. trip wires. And then that district would get no help with po population density. Um, or maybe the other circumstance where it does trip the one of those, but Lindenville doesn't even come close to tripping it. And that's where most of the kids are. They go to that one school in Lindenville. How would that scenario work out with your recommendation yeah. about population density? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so there, there are a couple of considerations here, right? So, and I think you've hit on, on an important nuance, which is that the population density weights are at the district level. Let me explain. So why is that? Um, there's an empirical reason, and then there's a conceptual reason. And this is something we certainly talked through with the agency of education and, and, and um, in, in, in the analytic process. So the empirical reason is, is that trying to calculate population density at the school level in a meaningful way is almost impossible to do in a reliable way. And it also is not, it's not, so that's one. Two, related to that is that the agency of education currently tracks population density at the district level. So to create a school level population density metric would both be difficult and something new that the agency would have to do. So that's, that's a consideration, right? The second thing, the more conceptually though, is that with Act 46 and decisions about schools and distribution of schools and access to educational opportunities within, within, a, within this larger area is actually being consolidated at the district level. And there was a conceptual concern that if you started, just like with the small schools grant, if you started to try to wait on some of these at these more micro level or sort of school-based factors that we'd run into the problem where, where, which we have in the small school grant right now, which is you may be providing in fiscal incentives for geographically unnecessary small schools to remain open. So the, so the idea of both empirically, one, we have these empirical challenges and then conceptually was to wait at the district level and then districts would have the flexibility to make these decisions. Is there anything called a perfect weight? No, there isn't. And there are trade-offs with this, right? And I think you've highlighted, right? So, and, and that's not the only district that might have one of those challenges, right? This is also a challenge, I believe, for Representative Conlon with down in Addison County with Cornwall. Um, ch chime in if I'm wrong on that, Representative. But, you know, like we have, we have areas that are more or less rural in some of these districts. And, you know, that, that is a consideration. It's a valid policy consideration. But I, I would say that those considerations have to be weighed against the ability to operationalize something in a meaningful way that's objective and systematic that can be that can be maintained, right? And two, that that we need to be careful that we don't inadvertently 
build into this system other kinds of incentives that are working against policy goals in other statute, name, namely Act 46. So it's, it's a valid point. Um, and you know, I think that's something that you as legislature Legislators need to discuss, but there. What I'm just trying to lay out is there. There are some. There is some rationale around that, and you know that's open for discussion. Is that helpful, Representative Beck? Yeah, thank you. And Representative Conley, I, I know I I sort of brought you into that conversation. I do want to make sure that if you want an opportunity to comment, you you can. Uh, no, I had the exact same question, and really appreciate the thoughtful uh, response. Okay, it's not intended to be penalty, it's it, it, punitive, right? Like it's when there's, there's science and then there, then there are some policy decisions that have to be made around these kinds of things. And what we try to do in our, our thinking is be really balanced and thoughtful across all of these trade-offs where, you know, some of these things are pretty empirically clear. Some things involve some trade-offs and this is certainly one of them. And, and there could be, there's certainly room for policy discussion here. Um, the one other thing I do want to point out, though, is that this, these weights, because we've used regression modeling, they go as a package, right? So when you pull one out, we have, right, you have to recalculate everything else. And that makes sense, right? Because what we're trying to do is comprehensively adjust for differences in costs across districts in a systematic way. And because we identified what the cost factors are, if you pull one out, for example, then there might be spillovers to another cost factor, right? You understand what I'm saying? So it's important to keep in mind that we started by identifying cost factors. These are the things. That, that account for spending differences across dis, across schools and districts outside their control. And here are the adjustments for those. Um, so I just want to put that point out there. Representative Austin, I think I see your hand up. Yep, just want to, yep. Um, I'm just wondering why uh, minority students weren't a category. Um, because when we did the cost fact, when we looked for cost factors, things that predict differences in cost, race, ethnicity did not account for differences in costs. We mm. didn't find that, right? But we also have to remember, and this is unfortunate, but is that there's oftentimes an overlap between economic disadvantage and race, ethnicity, and it makes it very difficult to parse apart the cost differences that might be due to systematic racism, right? and the cost differences that are due to economic disadvantage. That does not imply that, 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 that those, those, those factors might be a part of it. But what I would say is because those things are oftentimes highly correlated, it's likely that, that the cost variation is picked up in large part, or at least the portion that's due to economic, right? The portion that's due to economic disadvantage. Yeah. Um, but you know, these questions of how do we account for systematic racism and, and in um, school finance formula is, I think is going to be an important question for everyone nationally going forward. Um, and certainly something that the field is thinking about and working on, but it's, we're not there yet, frankly, with being able to estimate that in a reliable and valid way. Thank so, you. Professor Colby, um, I have a question and it relates to uh, the, the enrollment and population density question. Um, and we also have um, a categorical aid right now, it's about $20 million for transportation. You factored that in when you did this? Right, because yeah. in, with the way this works, right, when, when you, when, before the weights are, when, when we're applying weights, we've taken off all the categorical yeah. dollars, right? Before you start to do tax capacity. So all of that has come out. So when you're saying if you pull one, you, you've just pulled a thread that's going to sort of uh, right. upset the whole thing. So I, um, I understand the population density challenge mm -hmm. and what that means, but it looks like you've sort of double counted it here. One is your right. density and the Thank other you. is you're a small school. Thank you. These are the weights for, for those things. And so one of the things you could do is, and we recommend is that you conditioned the enrollment rates on population density and you are able to do that. And that's one of our recommendations. 
right? <laughs> so there could be, so, so if you think about it, these are independent cost factors, right? So we found, um, in fact, we just published a paper in one of the top journals in the country is that we found that there's actually a difference in costs that population density ha is a cost factor independent of school size. And oftentimes we conflate those two things, right? We say that they're small and rural and we, we don't, it's actually, they're actually, they drive costs in really different ways. So what it means is that a large school district operating in a rural area may also may have higher costs by virtue of being in a population sparse area, teacher labor, um, uh, higher wages, higher um, higher rates for contracts, things along those lines, right? We also know that we have economies of scale over here. So what? to be consistent from a policymaking perspective was to condition the enrollment weights on population density, but you would still apply population density weights independent of that. Does that make sense? I think so. So, but, but to actually- So it's not taking weights out. All you're doing is you're saying that, that, the, that for small schools that you would condition Turning on those weights, weights only in dist only in districts that were population sparse. Great, thank you, Representative Arison. Sorry for the delay. I, I'm, a, I'm following up on uh, the chair's comment on enrollment. Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, this isn't per building. This is per district. And we don't have any districts with less than no, 200. These are per these are per school. So per the building. Is, yeah, these are per building. And the way this would okay. work in in the way in the calculation, it would be the percentage of students in a district who who attend a school, for example, with less than 100 students, and then this weight would be applied to that count of students. Yeah, but isn't the population density per district the it way? Is. It is. The weights are all applied at the district level, right? Well, not district. They're all applied at the LEA level, right? And so any school level weight has to be calibrated up. Does that make sense? Am I, am, or should I explain it a different way? So what I mean by that is that, so let's take, um, let's take my school district, right? So, so let's take Washington West. Right, we have a number of small schools in our school district. And, but the weights all are calibrated, right? The weights we have right now are at the district level. If in fact we wanted to include a cost adjustment for small geographically necessary schools in a district, what we would do is we would say, as a percentage of students attending that district, how many are in, how many are schools? That would give you a number of students, right? And to that number, you would apply this weight. But all the weights we have right now are at the district level, at the LEA level. We don't weight at the school. Thank you. You can keep going. I know you have a little bit more. Okay. So just a couple high-level conclusions. Um, so and I think this is important, is that we have to remember that the weights we have in the current formula haven't been updated in 20 years. And so one of the things I've heard over the course of the last year is, boy, those feel like big differences. Well, there've been a lot of changes, <laughs> right? Since 1997 in educational costs. And so that's one thing. The second thing we have to, we have to remember though, is that the weights when they were originally put in place in the wake of Act 60, we're basically carryover holdovers from the foundation formula previously. And we could find no evidence that those weights were empirically derived. In fact, in talking to folks around the state, what we heard is, you know, those were kind of guesses about like what we thought the cost differentials were. Um, and they weren't estimated using what we would, we would have considered at the time or even now sort of contemporary methods for estimating cost differentials. So I think we have to remember that, you know, we've had sort of this stagnation in the state's funding policy has been a source of concern. The weights are widely viewed as outdated and sort of out of step with contemporary practices. And part of that reason is that the weights just haven't been recalibrated or reevaluated in a very, very long time. 
The second thing is, is that the weights and sort of our existing funding don't really recognize some pretty significant shifts in the state's educational policy and practices. Um, you know, small school grants, for example, stakeholders talked about like, this is really inconsistent with other things the states are doing. And so altogether, our findings suggest that it's time to incorporate new cost factors and weights into the formula, um, that the existing weights for economically disadvantaged ELL fall short of appropriately adjusting for the costs of educating students to common standards. We need two new cost factors, school size and population density. We need to think about refining the school level, I mean, the secondary level weight and breaking it into middle level and secondary grades. And we also need to, in doing all that, need to recognize that modifying the equalized pupil calculation may not translate into increased levels of spending in the districts with higher need. In fact, the equalized pupil calculation in the current funding formula isn't tied at all to expectations for what spending should be or quality. That's the existing formula, right? Like that's, that's not us making that up. That's just the way the formula works, right? And so the formula and the weights the, the role that the weights play right now is in terms of taxpayer equity, which was a key thing or a key point of response that the legislature was charged with dealing with in the wake of Brigham, right? So the weights are miscalibrated. This part of the existing formula is not operating the way it should operate because it's not equalizing costs. Um, then. The other, the other finding, just again, is there, there may be a need for new sources of, sources of categorical aid for student mental health and trauma-based instruction. So let me just stop there and I'll unshare my screen. Thank you. I think, as you know, um, implementing something like this uh, next year would be uh, quite traumatic. <laughs> um, in addition, uh, and if we implemented it over a period of time, we still are dealing with pulling one thread of education funding and not addressing some of the other very complex issues related to education funding. So um, this is sort of a sliver of the challenges <laughs> related to education uh, finance. So I guess what I'm looking at, um, what questions remain? So, so it, as this is one of the, the things that, that you presented evidence needs to be addressed. What are we missing going forward that we need to, need to address that we could set up this sure. year? Sure. Um, well, so our, the charge for our study was to do what we did. We evaluated the weights, we calculated new weights, we, we talked to stakeholders, we came up with recommendations. The scope of our work did not include a plan to implement anything, right? And I think you and many others on this committee and people who've asked me questions, ask good questions about, well, how do, what do we do next with this piece? And I think there's room for good thinking around that. Um, I certainly would be welcome the opportunity to think that through with a group or a task force or with anyone, but that wasn't in our charge, right? And so we, we did what we were asked to do, but I, you know, I think you're right. And I think there's, we, we do need to be thoughtful about this, right? Like these are big changes and, and we do need to be thoughtful about that. And I know that you have a number of bills that think about this different ways. And, and, you know, I think that's open for discussion and debate um, and, 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 should be, right? So that's one thing, right? And, but what I would say is that if no other changes are, if, if the existing formula isn't thrown out essentially, right? Like, you know, this is still the formula and the formula, a key component of this, a key, I'm sorry, a key requirement of the existing formula for it to remain in compliance with Brigham is taxpayer equity. We're not, we are not adjusting for differences in costs across districts. That's all the weights do, but that's not happening, right? So that said, like you, there are other things that we may be wanting to consider, right? So what are some of those things? We don't have a direct link between sort of state authority and local spending decisions, which means that we may end up with districts that are spending 
at less than optimal levels. And that can be underspending and overspending, right? Ideally, we would want all districts to be spending at an optimal level for for right their for what their students need, uh, but the, you know that's not connected to, for example, our EQS, education quality standards, right? We so that's that's one thing we have to think about. Another thing we need to think about is you know there's operating support and then there are targeted programs, and we have to be careful not to conflate how we fund those two things. Right, like general operating sports is sort of a basic school finance principle is like, you really have to be careful about thinking in terms of general operating support as categorical grants, right? Because what you do is you create all these silos, right? And these micro programs and requirements and, and things like, it, it's, it's problematic. It's part of the reason, right, for the move to Act 173, where we're trying to allow good decision makers at the local level some more flexibility and funding. Categorical grants are the antithesis of flexibility and funding, right? Because categorical grants are always targeted and for a specific purpose, and if and they come with their own monitoring and accountability standards. So when we want to think about using categorical grants, we want to think about that when we want to do something really specific and targeted, either for all schools or maybe select schools. So for example, you know, one of the findings in our report was around trauma and mental health. We know that schools are really struggling with that and different schools are struggling in different ways, right? But that's not necessarily general operating support. And then the third thing is, is that I, talked to this committee about this a couple of weeks ago, I'll say it again, we need to make sure that we're spending the dollars we have access to already, right? Yes. But we're turning back Title I and CEIS dollars. Like, but I think before we start, start sort of beating up on local school districts about that, I think we also then need to ask the question, why is that happening, right? And how can we build capacity in local school districts and local school boards to know how to invest dollars wisely? I know there's some school board members on, on, on this committee. It's a tough job, right? When you look at a budget and you're trying to say like, where do we invest dollars wisely? Where is my, Where am I gonna get the biggest bang for my buck? How should I prioritize my dollars, right? Local school districts need help with that, um, you know? And so that would, and then the fourth thing I said the other day, which is with respect to one-time money, CARES Act money, ESSER money, we need to be really, really careful about making sure that we use those dollars for one-time costs, right? So using those dollars, for example, for a categorical aid program for students in poverty as sort of a backdoor to, you know, let's not do something about the weights, let's do this. What you've done is you've created a recurring cost to the state that you may not build a fund going out. And that now comes with additional monitoring requirements, much like Title I, which is federal dollars, which we're already having trouble administering because it's a categorical funding program with specific requirements and accountability standards. So I don't know, I don't know, Kate, does that, does, does, does that, is that kind of guardrails around this too? Like, I think there's a lot of room here for good thinking and policy making, but you know, there are some places where I think we could really make things worse. <laughs> let's, let's not do that. <laughs> I've got some uh, other questions. I have three people lined up here at the moment, Representative Harrison, <laughs> then Brady, then Conlon. Yeah, my question is on the study itself. Uh, <laughs> Earlier in, in your presentation, you uh, alluded that other states use a similar system. And I'm curious if, if your results fell in line with theirs. So no other state uses a funding system like Vermont's. No, We're inventing no the wheel. We have reinvented the wheel. Most states operate a foundation formula. And that foundation formula where there's, there's a minimum and then right, applying weight, the weight, what the weights do is they generate additional revenue Ours doesn't do that. Okay. So when I say when I say all st that said, all states have funding formula that adjusts for differences in costs. They do that in different ways. We are the only state in the country that has this tax equity adjustment, where our weights operate to um, calculate equalized pupils for the purposes of adjusting tax tax 
capacity. Thank you. A little bit if I may, I'll add one other thing. Yeah. Um, we um, recently just did a study for, for New Hampshire, who's also, if you're following, really working hard on this issue too. And in that study, and I'm happy to for that long, in our report, we actually review all 50 states and have like some matrices that talk about what other states do. And so if you'd like to see that, I'm happy to point you to that report. Thank you, that would be great. Representative Brady. That's, that's a good segue to my question, actually, um, and maybe I just need to look more closely at that section. But I've heard Paul from the Public Assets Institute um, in talking about education finance a lot say, I, obviously, there's a lot of work to be done here, but on the whole, Vermont's education funding system is pretty equitable compared to a lot of states, which isn't to mean that there isn't a lot to work on here and some some huge challenges, but is that, do you think, is that a fair characterization? Like that, you know, there even from where we are, are right now that we're, us. yeah, okay. There are states <laughs> that are much worse than us. I, I don't want to, I don't want to put us, I don't want to rank us in terms of good guys, but I can tell yeah. you that, that, that there are states that are much more inequitable and inadequate. Remember that there are two, two pieces to this, right? Like we wanna make sure we're sufficiently funding and that the funding is fairly distributed, right? And so there are states that are far, that where spending is very low, raising real questions about whether or not sufficiency. And, the, and in some of those states, it's also inequitable. There are states where spending is high, where we have inequities, right? That are usually tied to um, differences across, you know, geographic areas, right, where you live matters. Um, so there are states that are much worse than us on both of those metrics. Representative Conlon. Uh, thanks. A topic that I brought up previously, um, and I always need to be made clear on this. So uh, your study talks about students with disabilities. We had the commit, uh, the uh, secretary in today, and he referred to, to special needs students. Um, and so I, uh, it was a little, I get a little confused as to where students on IEPs fall into this. I think you have said repeatedly, your study really looks at students, those that, that students on IEPs are separate and apart. They are separate and apart. In Vermont, right, are, we run, our, the state of Vermont operates a categorical grant program for that provides supplemental aid to local school districts to offset the cost of providing special education and related services to students with disabilities. Those are students with IEPs, not students on 504 plans. There are other students who are struggling students who might be struggling because of economic disadvantage who are non-disabled, right? So those, those students are covered in this analysis. Our analysis did not reopen, rehash the question of special education funding in the state. The only right. thing we did is we went in and we said, does it make sense at this time to include a poverty adjustment to the census grant block grant, which would allow us to acknowledge that there may be differences in the in sort of the incidence of disability in a community due largely due to poverty. And the consensus on that, uh, from our perspective, is that it's too soon to tell. That, you know, certainly a weakness of a, there are strengths and weaknesses. There's no such thing as a perfect funding formula for special ed too, right? And certainly, you know, we want to monitor that. But part of our comfort level on not making that adjustment yet and waiting to see comes from two places. One, on average, Vermont spends two and a half times the national average per IEP. Let me say that again. This is from the study we did in 2017. On average, we spent two and a half times the national average per IEP. We have a lot of money in our special education system right now. Whether that's appropriate or adequate, it's hard to know, right? But there's a lot of money. The second thing is, is back to that other stakeholder observation is, you know, these two systems are really closely tied and with tiered systems of support, which we really hope that school districts are putting in place, you know, early intervening services, et cetera. You know, the question needs to be, what happens here if we were to cal take care of the miscalibration over on the waiting side so that, right? What would happen then? 
Because for some school district, what that would do is create additional tax capacity to actually spend more on the general education side without changing tax rates. And that might change how those school districts feel about, a, about whether or not a census block grant is sufficient, right? Right. And I think what you said is um, that if you sort of wait for poverty as, rec as brought out in this, uh, that they would probably feel more comfortable with the census block grant system. That was, we heard that from many stakeholders in the yeah. field, right? right. And, and some of those stakeholders are superintendents, some of them, right? like broad range, range of people said, you know, and I think that's an important consideration in all of this, all of this discussion is that, you know, sometimes we like to break these things apart because we got a categorical grant, we got wait. When it comes to being in a school district, it, it, that's like money's fungible, yeah. right? Money's fungible. And so it, it's not that we can just sort of peel off one without thinking about the other. These two things are interrelated. And I think that was part of the reason that it was actually in Act 173 that the legislature called for the study of the weights. And just one quick question. Uh, how, do we how do we determine what is a geographically necessary small school? In our study, we recommended one approach you might use, which is okay. use the cut points. So a small school would be one that's below the 250 because we find in our study is that over that number of students that we just don't see a difference in costs. So it would be under that. And then we also find that there's really no difference in co right, costs over a certain, certain level, a certain level number of of individuals per square mile. And so a geographically necessary small school would be one that met the criteria of having higher costs outside their control. And that was in a geographic area where we also know that costs are higher. Thank you. I think one of the, the questions uh, that also exists here is um, we have high poverty districts that are high spenders and low spenders. And we have low poverty districts that are high spenders and low spenders. And always, there's always the question and always the call uh, to reduce education spending in the face of declining enrollment. Um, remembering the implementation of Act 60 uh, and seeing how that went for the, for the uh, how that, that sugared out, I think that there is a concern in adjusting these weights that it might certainly just end up increasing education spending. I think it's hard to know. And I, I you know, this is actually a good question for when Mark Perot comes back off of leave. Mm -hmm. Mark did a nice analysis in the wake of Act 60 about what those short-term decisions and what that did. And I am remembering what Mark told me Right, so correct, Mark will need to correct me. But I believe that there was a period of compression where, where, where the weights did their job in a way, right? Like they made it too expensive to spend dollars in just for certain districts. And so spending came down and they, they encouraged spending to come up in districts where you wanted to spend. My suspicion is, and this again comes from talking with Mark and, and please talk to him further so he can clarify. You know, my suspicion is, is that that compression went away over time because the weights weren't really working very well. They aren't adjusting for costs. And so money is really cheap for some districts and it's really expensive for others. And so unless those weights are calibrated properly, then the tax, the tax capacity isn't right. Like if you think about tax capacity as a potential governor on spending, it's not working because money is too cheap. Because all we're doing is rearranging deck chairs. We're not. We're not bringing. We're not. We're not bringing new dollars in. And so, if the weights aren't balancing this all the way around in a, in a way that's fair and equitable, then you're going to see sort of these anomalies at both ends of the distribution. Now, can can I say with any degree of confidence that that you change the weights and spending goes? No, I I, I can't do that. Right? Like I, that would be irresponsible, and I don't know that anybody can do that. The legislature, however, does have the ability to, however, put in guidelines around that. You guys get to make the laws, right? So, like, so you can put a floor in that says below you can't spend below this, and you can you can talk about what ex you can talk about that excess spending cap, right? There's no reason that you can't do some other things here. 
that might help to maintain or to put pressure on compression. But those policy actions are separate from calibrating the weights. We heard from um, the secretary today, looking at our uh, various proposals and had recommended uh, a phase-in plan, but also perhaps using some professional guidance mm -hmm. on the uh, missing questions. Uh, the I think that would questions. be a good idea. <laughs> Our hard questions. Yeah. So I, I'm sure that we would love to uh, check back in with you at some point uh, as we consider what those questions might be. Well, you know, here at UVM, we're, we, we're a land-grant university, and mm -hmm. we feel deeply committed to supporting the state in this. You know, we, we're not, we, we have no profit motive here. So, you know, we are happy to support the committee and, and the General Assembly in any way we can in this work. So then that can include bringing in outside experts like we did um, for this study. So you do let us know if there's some way we can support. Representative Beck, I want to just make sure that do you have anything that you wanted to add at this point? Um, no, I really, I really appreciate your comments, Tammy, especially those that, uh, you know, towards this is, this isn't just a one, it's not just waiting. It's not, it's a lot of different things that are working together to get us a result that's different from what we want. Thank you. Um, we have um, Colin Robinson in at the moment with the Teachers Association, and I think it's going to speak to the concept of waiting. Um, Tammy Colby, we'd love to have you stay with us. I understand that you actually I have need a to good go job. Teach. <laughs> need to go teach. First week back in classes, so I'm going to put on my other hat. But um, if comments or questions come up to which you would like my response, feel free to email me or. Thank you. Um, happy to come back, but it's, it's, thank you again for the opportunity to speak with all of you. It's nice to, to see everyone. Um, and again, happy to support in any way we can. And do send us the New Hampshire. I will. I, I have will. some people in this committee that read everything. That's great. That's Before great. you go, Professor, um, yeah. I do apologize for the day that we were supposed to have a radio interview and there was actually a structure fire I had to be at. But I remember that. I really remember that. Representative Sibelia is coming on on the 27th, so I'll see if I can maybe coordinate with you too. That'd be uh, great. That'd be no. great. Yeah, we were, I, he was one of the people I was going to interview, and he called me from a fire truck saying, I got to go. I'm like, I think you do. <laughs> I mean, let's be clear. School finance is important, but burning structures, I think, takes precedent. Do we all agree with that? <laughs> so thank you again for your willingness to participate. I appreciate that. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Committee, thank it's you. three o'clock. I'm inclined to power through with, with Colin as opposed to coming back. If you need to take a little break, just go off your screen. And, and um, I think it would be helpful if we just continued on through. Uh, Colin Robinson, we're really interested in hearing uh, what the NEA has to say about the question before us. Wonderful. Welcome. Well Thank you for having me, Chair Webb. For the record, Colin Robinson, um, I'm the political director of Vermont NEA. I think this is my first time in the committee this year. Good to see um, returning faces, good to see some new faces, and thanks so much for having us here. I recognize you just got a ton of information from Professor Colby, and um, knowing that I was coming after her, I intentionally made my remarks um, relatively brief and just wanted to sort of highlight some specific points. And just so everybody um, remembers, Vermont NEA, we are the union that represents teachers and school support staff all across the state. So <clears throat> to that end, specifically, I wanna touch base on sort of four points. So obviously waiting is, is important and we believe generally uh, making an adjustment now uh, is wise, whether that happens exactly in this moment or in future years is obviously going to be the conversation that you're embarking on. But addressing and adjusting weights is important. You know, one of the things that we hear a lot from our members, and we've been hearing them for some time, and those of you who have been on the committee previ in previous biennials have heard them speak to this. And quite frankly, Professor Colby just spoke to this as well, is that, you know, students are coming to school with incredibly complex needs, trauma and mental health needs, and schools are doing what they can to support those learners and those students to be able to access their learning. And 
waiting is a reflection of those increased needs. And I think obviously Professor Colby's report and that of her other colleagues really dove into that in a, in a comprehensive way. You know, the specifics of, of the numbers in her report, as you heard from Secretary French this morning, speak for themselves. You know, we don't feel like we're in a position to speak to whether those numbers are, are perfect, but she did obviously speak to how they intersect with each other. And it's sort of an all or nothing as it relates to um, how they're laid out. So we definitely think this conversation is critical. I think the other point that we wanted to lift up, and again, Secretary French, as well as Professor Colby have spoken this today, is the intersection with Act 173. Obviously, this study was um, enabled by Act 173 of the 2018 session. And Act 173 has had, up until this point, I think, two sort of delays in the implementation of the shift in the funding. And there's a whole lot of reasons that I'm sure your committee will um, at other times talk to and speak to and engage on that issue. But one of the critical components of Act 173, in addition to changing educator practice and how students and with disabilities and struggling learners are supported, is how the census block grant works. And you know, remembering back to the conversations of this committee and working on 173, and why, as Professor Colby said, and this waiting study was in there, is there is an incredibly strong intersection. And between Act 173 and the move to a census block grant structure and the waiting study. And I think it's just really critical for um, you all in this committee and policymakers generally to not lose sight of that because one of our concerns is that as Act 173 moves forward, if it doesn't take into account um, some of these issues raised in the waiting study, what could be unintended consequences on students and districts with some of the most significant needs? And once again, there are a lot of moving parts and moving pieces and synchronization of 173 with this waiting conversation we feel is, is really critical. So that's sort of point two. Point three is just wanted to highlight it, some specific comments on H54 that I think are, as you dig into this issue more broadly, are, are important um, to recognize. And we kind of pulled out as, as valuable notes. One is the phase in approach that is contemplated in H53 seems appropriate. Um, and I think, once again, the complexity that Chair Webb spoke to about implementation is something that we're very sensitive to and we recognize. And whether that is a phase in approach in H54 or some other implementation structure that makes sure it's done without negative adverse impacts on students and districts, while at the same time making sure districts and students have the resources they need to support student learning. So it's sort of a, a go slow message. And, and I would say that that I think is something I wanted to lift up from H54. The other note on H54 is that there is a moratorium on other changes to the education funding structure. And well, I would say I understand the reason for that. I think it actually makes a lot of sense, right? Because in order to, if you're moving too many things at the same time, you don't necessarily know what is having what impacts. And quite frankly, I think the education system um, over the past 10 years has a, had a lot of adjustments and changes and it's, it's not always clear what has had what impact on, on students and how we're supporting their learning. Um, and so I understand the intent of the moratorium, but recognizing that there might be conversations about broader and as Chair Webb spoke to, broader education funding adjustments we're concerned that putting a moratorium on any further changes would preempt other conversations that might need to be happening right now about uh, other adjustments in our education funding system. The third thing I wanted to highlight in H54 is generally the, the construct of studies and assessments of impacts of this change. One, I think, and we believe that's a good thing. Um, one thing that often, uh, I wouldn't say often happen, we've seen happen in the past is sometimes big seismic changes happen 
and there aren't built in structures for accountability to make sure that those intended benchmarks are met and that the intentions of the law are actually realized. And we appreciate that H54 actually has that baked in because there's a recognition, these are big adjustments. We wanna make sure that they're having the intended impacts. And if they're not creating um, ways for those adjustments to be addressed or need perhaps needed adjustments to be addressed along the way in the out years. And so I think that is a core principle as you dig into this um, at whatever time horizon that looks like is one that we think is important to lift up um, out of H54. So the final point uh, we wanna make on this is just how this intersects with the broader conversation about education funding in Vermont and specifically the recommendations of the tax structure commission that um, have come out. Obviously, as I'm sure you all are, are aware, they're presenting and recommending a fairly comprehensive restructuring of our education funding system um, now that we're 25 years out from Act 60. And it specifically is eliminating the residential property tax and um, making sure that everybody pays based upon their ability to pay, not just the two thirds that are currently receiving income sensi sensitization. Um, and that's something we support. Um, we've long supported that and we believe that that is a fair equitable way to go for districts, for students, as well as taxpayers. And so just wanted to flag to my earlier point and also Chair Webb's point that there's a lot of moving parts on this right now and waiting is a critical component of how we support our students as we move through into the next decade and emerge from the pandemic, how we effectively support struggling um, learners and students with disabilities as we continue to move forward with Act 173's implementation and the professional supports that educators need in, in addition to the education um, census block grant funding that goes along with that. And finally, as we look to tackling the recommendations of the Tax Structure Commission. So those are some high level thoughts on the waiting study generally, the waiting conversation that you all are embarking on and some specific things that we want to kind of lift out of H54 that we thought were pertinent to wherever your conversation may go. I, I thank you. Um, we did have another bill presented to us today, H184, and would love to have you take a look at that as well. Is that, that's Representative Beck's bill? Representative yes. Beck's bill. Yes. I, I apologize. I, I saw it was on the calendar and had not had an opportunity to dig, dig into it just yet. Okay. We will appreciate hearing from you, particularly on section 11. Okay. <laughs> Let it be a bit of interest to you. Um, Anything, any questions then for Colin Robinson? Okay, um, this has been quite a day. Um, Representative Conlon is gonna try to pull some of the things together related to the waiting study that we've heard. Oh, Representative Brady, please. Thanks, sorry. I'm just looking at um, the testimony you shared, Colin, and in the section about Act 173, you said, um, while it's far from being fully implemented, um, the Act requires educators to get trained in how to change their education practices to better serve all students, and that training simply hasn't happened yet. Um, and I just wonder if you can say a little bit more about that, about what the um, roadblocks are to it, or what the possible um, solutions would be to get to that training. <laughs> Yeah, um, so thank you, Representative Brady, for that question. I think that, um, and I, I will admit, perhaps I, I overstated it a, a little bit in there. There are some districts where, quite frankly, like the district you, where you serve on the school board um, in Chittenden South has been working with the DMG group to implement some of this work for a very long time. Um, I think what we have observed and what our members have seen is that it's very, very different in, in all across the state. And we just are concerned that if there is a date and time when the census block grant actually um, comes into effect, that all schools and all educators are prepared to make that, uh, make that shift, recognizing that some, some are much further along in that path than previously. And 
I think when Act 173 was originally um, passed, there was hope that the agency would be able to provide some high level professional development support to school districts. And that is what uh, has not happened. It's been sort of issue, district by district have been able to tackle this in, in different ways. I think the other, I think as some of you probably know, um, I don't wanna assume all of you, uh, multi-tiered systems of support, MTSS, which Act 173 is built upon is also not fully realized in all districts either. And in order for 173 to be a, to realize its potential as envisioned, it's built upon MTSS being effectively delivered and integrated into the instruction in all school districts. And similarly, districts are in different places in that process as well. So it, it perhaps my uh, statement there was slightly overstated, but it's not overstated as it relates to the agency of education providing support. Um, there is disparate uh, levels of um, sort of training capacity at different districts and um, different districts being in different posture to transition to the 173 structure. So, so Colin, um, the secretary was in the other day, had said he had done some work on the, the scheduling challenges that are identified in the DMG report, and they have been providing some support there. Um, as you know, oh, excuse me, no, actually, my next, my question is, MTSS, what can we do to help? We understand that it's, what can we do? We're excited. Tell us what you want us to do. I, I, I mean, you know, I think that this is a, a theme that uh, this members of this committee who have been here before have heard is that the agency of education, quite frankly, is is under resourced, and I think that there is perhaps an opportunity with some of the federal dollars to create short term positions I, um, to perhaps provide technical assistance and support to districts. Um, I think also, obviously, um, H101 I think is intended to provide some district level coordination. I know it's not necessarily MTSS specific. Chair Webb. I've got that in mind. But exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think those types of things, but quite frankly, I, I do think that having greater capacity in the agency of education to provide guidance and support would be, uh, would be useful. So one time money to either bring in some expertise through the agency or professional support provided regionally? Yeah. Yep. I think that could, I think that could be it. And also it could be, would you set, would you do me a favor? Would you send us something like that in writing? Yes. It, it, everything gets, gets lost in the virtual world. So. I appreciate that. Yes. Happy yeah. to. Um, anything else? Thank you. Um, Representative Conlon and Representative Beck would love it if you would have a conversation to help us figure out how to move forward, um, since you have been following this for a long time. Well, we're going to try to, we're going to, we're try, going to try to find time. Yeah. Um, this has been a very interesting day, that's for sure. Um, appreciate the committee's time and attention uh, during this. Uh, you came to the education committee and um, it's, we've got, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> and I appreciate everybody's willingness to, to stick with it and show up every day. And um, I think with that, if there's any, not anything else, we'll go offline. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.